Hey folks, welcome back for another episode of Code Club. If you have been diligently following along in recent episodes over the past few months now, you know that I am in the process of building out a R package that I hope to one day have posted up to CRAN. Currently, it's on GitHub, and we've been seeing some of the cool tools in recent episodes on GitHub that we can use to uh, provide documentation, to make sure that our package builds. Today, we're gonna use GitHub again, but we're gonna use it to help us with style. Uh, what is style? Well, I don't have much style <laughs> when it comes to how I dress, but hopefully my code has some style. And so style is, uh, when it comes to code, is a concept that helps us to think about and improve the readability of our code. If you've ever looked at articles in, say, a newspaper or news website at this point, I guess, or in a journal, uh, you'll notice that the papers or the articles are all styled the same kind, kind of way, right? They use the same type of English, whether it's British or a US-based English, um, the same type of punctuation, whether or not they use an Oxford comma, uh, these types of things are all part of style, and there are a variety of style manuals that one can use. Recall, uh, Strunk and White has a style manual that's quite humorous um, and very uh, pedantic. <laughs> uh, there's also the APA style manual, right? If you go to your favorite journal website, you'll also see a style manual for how they want papers formatted when you submit them. Well, again, code is no different. Here in my browser, I have two pages describing two different R styles. So the first page here is the Tidyverse style guide. I'll come back to that. Here is Google's R style guide. It's much shorter uh, than the Tidyverse style guide. What you'll notice here in the second paragraph is that the Google R style guide is a fork, meaning that they took the Tidyverse style guide and then copied it and made some modifications, right? And so that is based on, those modifications are based on uh, Google employees and how they use R. And uh, they do things um, like using camel case. We'll talk about that in a bit. Um, all sorts of uh, different things. Um, and, and I think ultimately what we're going to find is that the tidyverse style guide is really what we want to use. And so again, the tidyverse style guide was originally written by Hadley Wickham. Um, this is uh, a web page that, again, is at style.tidyverse.org. Um, and it's, you can, it's built on a website that's like PackageDown, which we use to build documentation for our package, but it's built using a package called BookDown that allows you to write books using R Markdown, which, or Quarto at this point, which is pretty cool, right? And so um, over on the left side here, you'll see various chapters, if you will, for different types of um, encounters you might have with code and how they should be styled, right? And so... If you look at files, it has descriptions of how we should be naming things. So file names should be meaningful and end in .r. And so we want to avoid using special characters in file names. So stick with numbers, letters, underscores, and hyphens, right? And so fit underscore models .r is good. Fit space models .r is bad. Spaces are generally always bad <laughs> when it comes to naming things, all right? And again, it's nice to have a capital R as your file extension to signify what's going on, right? Uh, there's all sorts of other great information in here about how to style things. Some of the things um, might seem a bit, you know, over the top and just kind of, like I said earlier, pedantic. Like, why does it matter if we use snake case, which is day underscore one, rather than capital uh, day, capital O one, right? Um, it, it doesn't matter, right? But what's important is that everything is written the same way. Because if someone is reading through the code, then that might they might wonder like why is this written in snake case versus day one here written in camel case? That just that adds confusion. It also adds confusion to the developer because I have to remember did I write that variable name in um, in camel case or did I write it in snake case? If I always have a rule that I always write everything in snake case, I don't have to worry about it, which is which is pretty slick, right? And there's all sorts of other information in here about naming functions about having overly long lines uh, that we generally want things, I think, kept about 80, uh, 80 characters uh, across a page. All sorts of other great information here. Pipes, um, uh, ggplot2 types of things, right? Um, again, all this stuff is, is very helpful. There's also a section in here about packages and kind of styling that you might want to think about when uh, developing a package in t terms of like how things are named, how things are organized, uh, the documentation that you use, uh, tests, error messages, 
how you might go about writing a news uh, uh, .md file, which we did a couple episodes ago, and then how you might interact with uh, version control such as Git and GitHub. Coming back to the first page of the Tidyverse style guide page, you'll notice that there are two packages that help with using the Tidyverse style guide. This is a huge document and trying to remember everything would be really hard. I think over time you kind of develop good style yourself so you don't have to worry about like, you know, with fashion, like what clashes or what style of English to use or how many spaces to put uh, to start a new line uh, of your code or, you know, what type of assignment operator to use. You just kind of learn it over time, right? And so to help you along that, there are two packages that we'll talk about today. Uh, one is called Styler, uh, Style R, uh, and the other is Lint R. And so we'll talk about Lint R first, and then we'll talk about Style R, and then we'll talk about how we can use all this on GitHub. So Lint R is uh, a linter, <laughs> L-I-N-T-E-R. So a, a linter is uh, something that goes through your code and looks at the style. It's, it does what's called a static analysis of your code to look for possible problems. So like, you know, if you have a line of code that's 500 characters long, it's gonna say that's too long. And so it'll flag things and tell you when things are problematic. And so to go ahead and get started with using lint R, if you go to the lower right corner and click on that packages tab and do lint R, you'll see that I already have it installed, but you could go ahead and install lint R if you wanted. Uh, using that install button and then installing. I've already got it installed, so I'm not gonna do that, but I'm gonna go ahead for now and do library lint r. So there's a variety of ways that you can use the linter. So we could do lint, uh, and then I could give it a file name. So let's let's try that with like r forward slash, oh, what's one of these that's uh, perhaps not so hard. We'll do print taxonomy.r, running that. We then see that it opens up print taxonomy.r, uh, with uh, all my Roxygen up at the top and then my code. It's been a while since we've looked at this. And so then what you see down here in the bottom are the variety of problems that the linter de de uh, detected, right? So on line 35, it says uh, spaces left parentheses linter. Place a space before left parentheses except in a function call. So if I put a, go ahead and put a space there and then I uh, rerun my linter, I now see that that problem is gone. And so then 37, it says, put spaces around all infix operators. And so an infix operator would be like this plus sign. And you'll notice that the cursor went directly to where there's the problem. And so it wants spaces around that plus sign. And so you'll notice that on line 39 and 43, I have the same thing. So 39 there and 43, uh, that's probably this, right? So go ahead and save. And then we can go ahead and relint, and we kind of keep repeating, right? Uh, line 37, line should be no longer than 80 characters. This line is 86 characters, right? And so uh, we would, might want to think then about how we would clean that up. Maybe I'll put a line break right there, and then uh, bring over the, the arguments for paste, uh, and we'll do something like this, right? And so the idea then is that we don't want lines that are overly long because then I have to scroll to the right to find them, right? And so on line 41, um, well, I think it was line 30, uh, line should be no more than 80 characters. That's this here, right? And so we have the same type of problem. And I wonder if I do this, what happens actually. So let's go ahead and do both of those changes and then relint. And that seems to have gone away. Uh, indentation should be six, this is eight. So this was kind of my attempt to solve that problem earlier. Uh, so let's go ahead and clean this up a bit. And yeah, actually, you know what? I think I can put all this on one line now. Yeah, so that makes the code again a lot easier to read. I can always put more spaces between the code to make it easier to read, to kind of uh, go easier on the eyeballs by giving it kind of air uh, around my code. Running that again, uh, line 51, trailing blank, blank lines linter. We've got trailing blank lines are superfluous. So I go ahead and remove that. And then I go ahead and can lint again and everything goes. There's no problems anymore, right? And so again, if I look at markers, that's all clear. So that was doing one file and that's a bit uh, tedious, right? Um, there's also lint uh, dir. And so there I could do like r forward slash and it'll then lint the entire uh, 
our directory and you can see all the problems that I have in here. Uh, one, two, three, four, uh, five files or so. Uh, the other thing that we could do instead of lint dir would be lint package. And that then takes the package that we're currently in and then lints the entire package to see where there are problems. And so um, you'll now see uh, that it's going not just into R, but also data hyphen raw uh, to, to look for the different problems that I have in my code. By default, lintr is using the tidyverse style guide. To learn more about lintr, I'm here at the lintr website. So it's lintr.r-lib.org. Um, we've built these sites, so we kind of have an intuition now for how they work. Um, it, again, describes that lintr provides static code analysis for R. And that, um, yeah, and, and that it, by default, as I mentioned, uses the tidyverse, but there are ways to use other styles or to add uh, more restrictions to the types of things we're looking for in our, our linting, right? So if we go to this get started page, right? Um, we've talked a little bit about using lint, linter, lint package, and that you can configure your linter, right? So to get going uh, more formally with using the linter, we could use use underscore linter. And let's go ahead and look at the help page for that. We see that it will create a minimal linter config file as a starting point for further customization. And so there's two types of configuration you can create. One is tidyverse and one is full. Tidyverse creates a minimal linter configuration based on the default linters um, that follow the tidyverse style guide. And then there's also full creates a linter configuration using all of the available uh, linters. So I'm gonna go ahead and use the tidyverse. And so if I, again, do use linter and then look in files down here now, I see a dot linter file. And this then shows me linters, linters with defaults, uh, and then the encoding. And so if we wanted to modify or add linters to um, our, our testing, then um, we would add that within the parentheses here of linters with defaults. I could do line length linter, and I could say 120. And so what this will do will be to allow me to have a file with uh, line lengths that are up to 120 characters rather than the default. And if I want to learn about line length linter, I could do question mark line length linter. And then I see then that the default is 80 columns wide, right? And so this, again, allows you uh, to look at all the different possible linters. And so if I click on this list link for linters, I see all of the different types of linters that are available for using within uh, this linters with defaults. So let's go ahead and see how this works. And I will come back to uh, print taxonomy here. And let's go ahead and put this line back to being quite long. And before, this gave me a problem because I have this vertical gray line at 80 characters. Um, whereas this, uh, I'm not quite sure how wide this is. Um, I, th I think it's at 113, right? So let's go ahead and lint and we'll do r forward slash uh, print uh, taxonomy. And it's complaining. <laughs> Make sure it ends in a new line. So let's see. Um, okay. So it does, it says offending lines start with uh, a parentheses. So let's go ahead and put this back here. All right, and so we'll go ahead and run that. That works fine, and there's no problems, right? And But again, if I put this back to 80 uh, and then rerun it, then it complains that this line has more than 80 characters, okay? And so the point that I'm trying to illustrate here is that you can modify the specifics of what is getting linted. We go ahead and remove uh, this default because 80 is the default. I'm happy with that. Let's check the console. We'll lint, make sure everything passes. That's good. So in addition to all of these linters that exist with links to uh, the individual packages, you can also come up into these different uh, groups or tags that bundle together different linters, right? So there's like a best practices, common mistakes. Uh, the default has the tidyverse styled linters, right? And so these are the ones that are in uh, the tidyverse, right? And so one that kind of caught my eye would be like best practices. And so these are uh, some of the best practices that it is um, encouraging you to look for, right? 
And so maybe what I'll do is grab one of these to show how we can supplement the default. So I'm gonna go ahead and grab this absolute path uh, linter. I can then put in absolute uh, path linter and go ahead and save that. Maybe to test this, uh, I'll go ahead and, and do something like read TSV and then I'll do forward slash users pschloss uh, and then I'll do like test.tsv. Uh, that file doesn't actually exist, but what's important is that this is an absolute path. So now I'll go ahead and rerun that lint and we'll see that that absolute path linter uh, got flagged. Um, at the same time, I just wanna make sure that it's still doing the default. So if I leave that long one in and lint, I see that it gets both of those, right? And so what we're doing with this dot linter is we're using uh, the defaults, but we're also adding the absolute path linter, okay? Um, I'm gonna go ahead and s remove that. And I'll also come back here and undo all my uh, shenanigans. And let's go ahead, save, and then relint to make sure that all passes. So again, if I do lint package, I see a whole bunch of stuff, right? And uh, maybe I'll look at this data.r. Um, and so in here, it's flagging uh, line length linter. Uh, line should be no more than 80, right? We, we know this. And so this line, uh, line 13, as I see the cursor here is 87 characters. And then this one further down, uh, line 27, is 169 characters, right? So um, there's a variety of ways to deal with this. So one thing I could do clearly is uh, put in a line break here uh, and then go ahead and relint the package. And I see that that warning went away. But for something like line uh, 28, I can't really shorten that, right? Because this just kind of keeps going. It's a, it's a long URL, right? And so there's a variety of ways to deal with, um, with that because we would like to get our markers page to be perfectly clear. And so what do we do? Well, there's a variety of things we could do. So I could start by doing something like no lint start. And then down here, I could put say like a pound no lint end. And so that should tell linter to not do the linting. So we'll go ahead and lint the package again. So we now see that the, the data.r file doesn't turn up anything, right? Uh, and so, so this is a bit of a, a blunt tool, right? Um, and so the what it's doing is it's basically saying, don't lint anything that's between lines 25 and 29. Alternatively, we can have a bit more precision uh, by turning off a specific linter. So here I could do no lint, and then um, it's the line length linter, right? And so I'll do no, no lint line length linter, okay? So again, if we try to lint this, we see that again, it skips over data.r and that it is not linting uh, data.r on this specific line, right? And so again, the you could do the no lint start, no lint end to kind of bracket text you don't want to lint. You could also then say no lint colon line length linter, and you could kind of add on uh, other uh, linters that you might want to add, right? So like I could also add here like trailing uh, blank lines linter, right? Uh, by separating those with commas. And then for that line, it would not lint that, right? And, and if you go ahead and look in the documentation, you can see more sophisticated ways to have the linter ignore certain lines uh, with certain linters, right? Uh, but again, I think no lint start, no lint end, no lint colon, and then the name of the linter is a powerful way to get started for things that really we can't do anything about, right? I can't, I can't help that this URL is so long. Nothing I'm gonna do is gonna get it to be under 80 characters. So another way that we could use the linter within our studio is to come up to the top here where we see add-ins. And if you click on that, you'll see a variety of add-ins that people have produced that work well with our studio. One is under a linter section, right? So lint current file. Uh, again, I've got print taxonomy open. If I lint that file, nothing happens. If I were to say instead open, uh, let's say kmers.r and do uh, lint current file, it's gonna tell me all the problems with this file. And there are quite a few things it doesn't like with this file, right? Um, and, and so a lot of the same types of things and things where the name of the linter kind of tells you what it's doing, right? 
Um, and so that's pretty slick to have this add in if you don't want to type things at the command line or you forget the, the name. Also, there's lint current package. This is another add in that you can use where it basically lints the entire package, uh, to, including tests um, and everything else to make sure that things are nicely formatted. But again, uh, when we look at the full package, there's quite a few things that need to be updated and fixing these things in hindsight is gonna get pretty tedious because there's just a lot of things to fix, it appears. And so there is a handy tool in R, uh, a package called StyleR that I mentioned at the beginning of the episode. And StyleR allows you to restyle all of the code that offends the linter, or at least makes pretty good headway in resolving the issues that it can easily get through. And so you can imagine using style R and lint R together to resolve these types of problems. So you can get to the style R webpage by going to style r.r-lib.org. And again, you get this nice package down site. Um, you can, you can kind of see from this GIF a little bit about what it does and that it also has an add-in uh, for using with RStudio. We can install the package with style R and um, let's go ahead and go to get started to see uh, how you might use it. And so we can see that it's got very similar syntax to lintr, right? Lint file instead of lintr, lintr, lint package, right? So let's go ahead and load the style R package, make sure that we have it installed. Again, if I do style R, I've got it, right? And that we can then go ahead uh, click this box and that will automatically run the library function for us. So I'm gonna work on styling kmers.r, but before we do that, I wanna kind of look at some of the things that linter flagged, right? So it flagged uh, line 24 as being too long, uh, line 95, um, it doesn't like that there's not a space before the opening curly brace, so it wants a space there. Um, and let's see. Um, line 101, it also wants a space there. So it's basically complaining that I don't have enough spaces in my functions, right? Uh, so let's go ahead then and go ahead and try to style our kmers.r. So we'll do style uh, file and we'll do r forward slash kmers.r. This goes through. Uh, I kind of saw some updates here in the file. And so it talks about styling one file, cameras.r, and gives us a little bit of a count of like the numbers of files that were left unchanged, that were changed, or that threw an error. And so basically one file changed, and you'll see that we now have that space before the curly brace, and uh, my for loop here also has a space before that parentheses. And if we scroll back up to this line that was rather long, um, let's see, where did that go? I think that was all the way up at the top right here, uh, where line 24 still goes off the right side of the screen. So let's go ahead and lint the package again. And we see that that line is still too long, um, but that those, um, those problems <laughs> with the spaces around the braces went away. And so it seems that StyleR does a pretty good job of getting rid of a lot of problems, but, but perhaps not everything. So let's go ahead and then do style uh, package, pkg. We'll go ahead and run that. Again, by default, it is looking at the Tidyverse style guide. And so we see that um, it went through all of these files and it left six files unchanged, changed 11, and nothing had an error. Um, and it says, please review these changes carefully because you might worry that some, um, some changes implemented uh, a change in the code and how it ran. So what I'm gonna do is in my builds tab, I'm gonna go ahead and click test and make sure that all my tests still pass. They do, so that, that's a good sign. And then we can repeat the linting. So I'll do lint package, run that, and then hopefully get a much tidier list, shorter list of where we have problems. And there's a lot of these things where the line should be no more than 80 characters. Um, and also where I have some commented code. So again, back here in, uh, kmers.r. So let's look at this one to see what it is. Um, this is a bit of um, kind of the formula for calculating the conditional genus probability. So I'm kind of okay with leaving that, but maybe I could add some text around it. I think what I'm going to do is go ahead and manually go through all these and resolve the problems. And I'll be right back once I've got everything cleared up. 
So as I'm going through this code, uh, some things popped out that I wanna show you how I'm dealing with. So within my testkamers.r script, I've got this block of uh, comment. And so here, if you recall, was kind of my manual calculations of calculating word-specific priors for different kamers. Uh, so 26, 29, 30, and 64. And so I'd like to preserve this, and I'm not, I don't, I don't have a problem with that being there. It sees this as being R code, and sure enough it is, but again, it's showing how I got to the expected values that I'm showing down below here. And so what I think I'll do here then is I can say no lint, and I can say start, and then again, I so I could leave it at no lint start, but I'm gonna go ahead and put in then commented code linter. Again, by putting in the specific linter, uh, I'm not ignoring all possible linters, only the commented code linter. And so then here I can do no lint end. Let's go ahead and save that, go to the console, lint the package again, and then that goes away. I've gotten down to the final file that it's upset with, which is my vignette, my phylotyper.rmd uh, vignette. And it's upset, again, that I have uh, this commented code and it wants it removed. I like having this here because it shows people the alternative way to install phylotyper using install GitHub. Um, it also is complaining down here that I've got uh, these rather long lines um, and I don't want to have my linter code kind of in here with, uh, with, with my R code. And so what I would like to do is have the linter ignore this file, phylotyper.rmd. Do that, I can come back to my files, into my, into my .linter file, and then I can create a new line. I'll say exclusions, colon, and then we're gonna give it a list, and then the list of file names to exclude. Vignettes, phylotyper, dot rmd, get rid of my extra period, philotyper.rmd. Let's save that and then come back to our console to relint. It's still complaining and let me see, uh, wouldn't you know it, I misspelled philotyper. Uh, so philotyper.rmd, let's go here, lint package, and everything is clear and I've gotten through everything. If I had multiple vignettes that I wanted to ignore, I could also just give it the directory name, vignettes, console, lint package, and again, that'll do ignore the entire vignettes directory. I'll go ahead and leave that in there to be a bit more specific. And so, sure enough, we've gotten through and we have uh, cleared all of our linters, right? So again, by using lintr and stylr, we can define the style that we want to conform to. We can get stylr to kind of get us part of the way to kind of clearing up those problems. And then we can um, do some manual curation uh, and a lot of kind of rerunning uh, uh, lint package. You can see here I ran lint package a bunch of times to kind of get through a lot of um, the problems that lintar was discovering. So again, hopefully this doesn't affect how the code runs. I'll go ahead and run the test just to double check. What it mostly does is help it help you to have a, a code base that is easier to read, okay? So the final thing that I wanna do is show you how we can use GitHub Actions to automatically do the linting for us once we say push things up to GitHub or if somebody is submitting a pull request and we perhaps haven't run their code through um, our, our style guide through, through our linter, we wanna know uh, if there's any problems in the code. And so we're gonna go ahead and use a, a lint-based um, GitHub Action to do that. So coming back to the lintar website, under articles, there's a link for continuous integration, and we're gonna be working with GitHub Actions here, right? So thankfully, the Actions package from r-lib that we talked about in the last episode has a linter, or has an action that will lint our entire package for us. And so basically what we'll see is that it runs lint package on our package. So we'll do use this, use GitHub um, Actions, Right, and then we'll say lint. This is making a number of changes. And uh, before I do this, actually, I'm gonna come back to get, and I wanna be sure to uh, add all these things that I did for linting. Uh, so I can keep my linting and my GitHub action separate, okay? And so we'll go ahead, do all this. And it occurs to me that I probably also wanna run document and that I probably also want to build it 
to double check that everything still works well. All right, so I got one note. I'm glad I ran the check and basically it found my .linter file. And so I need to put that into my .r build ignore file. And so I'll put in here then uh, .linter dollar sign. Let's go ahead and rerun the check and it, everything should pass now. Wonderful, so now that ran through A-OK, -okay, I can go ahead and update uh, what I'm going to commit. I'm not going to commit that uh, lint YAML file just yet, because again, I wanna keep my linting efforts separate from my efforts to build in these GitHub actions. So we'll go ahead then and commit this, and I'll say applied uh, tidyverse based linter to package. And we'll go ahead and commit close. So again, we now have this new file, the lint.yaml file that is in my .github workflows. Again, lint.yaml. We see that on pushes and pulls, it's going to go ahead, um, basically set up a Ubuntu environment, and then it's going to run lint package on the entire package. Cool. So let's go ahead and we can add that and we can commit. We can say add uh, GitHub action to apply linter to package. So we'll commit and then we'll go ahead and push. We see that the push got up here and we're pending. Go ahead and check that and we see that all of our uh, various uh, uh, automations are running, including our lint.yaml. Uh, so let's go ahead and check details on that. I suspect that's going to take the longest because as we've seen in the past, the first time a GitHub action is started, it's got to install a whole bunch more things where I think for you know subsequent pushes, it has a lot of that information already in cache. And so it just, it goes a lot faster. So that completed, everything went well. Um, of course, because I ran the linter uh, locally. Um, and so again, if we come back and we look at all of our other workflows, uh, let's come back and we see that everything passed A-OK. -okay. And if I look back at my commit message, um, I see that I've got my green check saying that everything passed and the whole thing took a couple of minutes to run. Again, the purpose of the linter is in some ways to detect possible problems with codes. You might think of these as code smells, but mostly it's to help readability of your code. And so as we've seen using linter and Stylar really helps get us a, a long way. And that we saw that we can customize linter to tell it to ignore certain things. The kind of the, the areas where I uh, need to improve my own skills to in styling the code, I think is putting a space before uh, a, a parentheses in like a for loop or while loop or, or if statement. The second would be uh, long lines. Uh, typically this was happening for me because I would have like a DNA sequence that's maybe 250 characters or a taxonomy string that would be rather long or we saw also URLs that are rather long. And so we saw that we could use the no lint flag to tell linter to ignore that. Uh, the other thing that I saw was the problem of having code that's commented out. Uh, that is a code smell actually that it's trying to protect you from because oftentimes people will comment on and off code uh, when they're testing things and that it's very easy to forget to comment something or to uncomment something. And uh, it's also not reproducible, right? Because if you run it to produce one plot with the thing commented and another plot with it uncommented or whatever way it goes, um, you get different plots. And so really what it's trying to force you into is, is a better coding practice. Ultimately, that's really what styling your code is trying to do. In the next episode, we'll take the next step and seeing again how we can use these tools like Linter and Stylar with Git uh, so that we can enforce checking the quality of our code before we even commit our code and certainly before we push it up to GitHub so that you don't miss that exciting episode. And trust me, I'm excited too because I've never done this before. I'm really excited to try it out with you all. Please make sure that you've subscribed to the channel and you're telling your friends about all the great stuff we're doing here on Code Club.